Well, the way you phrased it actually suggests the problem Sri Lanka faced, because initially we were told that there was a panel appointed to advise the Secretary General on accountability issues, uh, which seemed perfectly acceptable. Um, Now, this panel seems to have thought not only that it needed to consider all allegations brought before it, which again, I suppose is not a problem, but without doing any inquiry, it seems to have decided that these allegations are credible. Now, this has put us in a bit of a spot, because obviously when there is such a report on the table, even if it is unofficial and not a UN report, as the Secretary General indeed has told us, it's a private report to him, um, obviously people will start thinking of these allegations as credible. So what has really happened is individuals have responded, just as the panel as individuals have taken upon themselves to constitute some sort of inquiry. And some of these are available. I mean, most of the more grave allegations have been addressed in my blog, where we've looked at some of the grave allegations, and I've shown that, in fact, far from being uh, a scholarly account, this is really a rag bag of information. For instance, we've shown that where they cite sources, the sources are all wrong. For instance, they refer to the Secretary General's report that talks about LTT atrocities and then they cite it as evidence of Sri Lankan atrocities, and uh, they don't look at things said by the ICRC and the UN officially. So it's a bit of a messy thing. Uh, But I think it has been, in one sense, a good opportunity, because as some Australian academics have told us, we have a very good story and we haven't told it. And I hope very much that my colleagues in other branches of the government, I'm not in the executive branch anymore, I'm just an MP, but I hope many of them will put their stories together and make it clear that much of what this report alleges is uh, really quite fraudulent. Last month, the foreign minister for Sri Lanka, Lakshman Paris, uh, I think, did say that the United Nations uh, report was essentially feeding into political agendas, uh, uh, trying to destabilise your country. Is that is that an official position of the Sri Lankan Parliament, uh, or is that just uh, the view of the foreign minister? Well, I can't quite remember exactly what he said, but if he was suggesting that this report is being used by people who want to destabilize Sri Lanka, it's certainly correct. And if he was implying that some of the members of the panel did have prejudices against Sri Lanka before, which might lend themselves to being used in such a way, he's also correct. For instance, I think we've shown that uh, Mr. Ratner had initially described Sri Lanka as an apartheid situation. Now, you have to forgive uh, American ignorance of certain things. You know, these are the guys who actually allowed apartheid to continue for so long. But, you know, to really compare a situation in South Africa, which was absolutely appalling, to Sri Lanka, where, as you know, senior members of government, the uh, IGP, the Army Commander, the Attorney General, Wal Tamil, uh, in fact, during the worst days of attacks on Tamils, which took place in 81 and 83, the Attorney General of Sri Lanka, who then later turned into a LTT mouthpiece, was the Attorney General and defended that appalling government and what it did to Tamils. So I think to call it apartheid is a bit silly. And then you have uh, Kiki Darusman of Indonesia, who, uh, you know, there have been several questions questions about the way he seems to have changed his approach to human rights. He was, at one point, the head of the uh, Indonesian Human Rights Association, and then he was on a panel afterwards. He seems to have then insisted on very high standards of proof with regard to numbers, and he seems to have um, changed his position now. So we're a bit worried about individuals like that. And also so you're, accus- most you're, 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 that he you're, look- you're accusing him of a double standard, essentially, in their methodology. I'm accusing him of having used different standards earlier. I don't know what his other recent work is now, but it's it's a pretty lucrative profession being on UN reports. And as I said, Ratner had uh, maybe idealistic, and some Americans are very idealistic. We're told by some Republicans that part of the problem is individuals who felt very idealistic about Iraq and Afghanistan have to be quiet about that, so they want to shout about smaller countries. But it's double standards, a refusal to look at evidence. And I do think that when they absolutely ignore letters from the head of the ICRC in Sri Lanka, talking about our disciplined armed forces, and only describe the LTT, a bunch of brutal terrorists, as disciplined, you begin to realise that their worldview is very cockeyed. So does the Sri Lankan parliament intend on debating any further or taking any action about the initial United Nations uh, call for investigation uh, in, in any way at all? 
Well, I have no idea what my colleagues in Parliament would suggest, but certainly after the report came out, we've had a couple of sessions and we haven't really thought it worth noticing. I think the problem really is that the international community, which had some prejudices against Sri Lanka, and in particular the rump of the LTTE, are taking this more seriously than it should be. I've had very positive discussions with a number of Australian parliamentarians recently, some of whom uh, referred to the report, others of whom didn't, all of whom were really concerned more with the situation of the Sri Lankans on the ground now, and in particular the Tamil communities that had suffered in the Vanni from the LTT, being used as human shields, uh, being shot at when they tried to escape, not getting some of the food that we sent up to them, while, as the new guy has remarked, the LTT itself was chock full of chocolates and uh, meat and so on, which they were not sharing with the people. Those people suffered. We have a very strong responsibility to do better by them. And I was very glad that the Australian Parliament is really more concerned about Sri Lankan uh, in, Sri, in, Colum- in Sri Lanka, especially the Tamils, rather than the antics of the LTT rump abroad. If you've just tuned in, this is 612 ABC Brisbane, ABC Local Radio Queensland, Coast FM on the Gold and Sunshine Coast, ABC Digital and more. I'm speaking with Professor Rajiva Wijasinghe. He's a member of the Parliament of Sri Lanka. He's previously served as the Secretary General of the Sri Lankan Government Secretariat for coordinating the peace process. And my name's Steve Austin. So uh, given, uh, I mean, this is of interest to Australia, uh, Professor Wajasinga, because many of the people, the victims uh, of who knows what status of the closing stages of the government of Sri Lanka's war with the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, uh, the the closing stage is that many of those people hopped onto boats and came to Australia seeking refuge. Uh, And it's unclear as to what their status is. It's been said to me that uh, many uh, Tamil Tigers did come into Australia, but they were wealthy enough to fly in uh, lawfully, uh, that the people that came by boats are essentially genuine refugees, victims of this this terribly uh, uh, brutal and long-lasting civil war in your country. Can you clarify this at all for me? Is there anything you wish to add to well, that? Well, I think the first thing to say is that given this wonderful country, except that it's now very cold, many Sri Lankans would like to come and settle down here. And this had nothing to do with the war or suffering. Um, I think it's perfectly correct to say that many people have wanted to come here, and given um, your situation here, it's perhaps easier if you're Tamil and can claim persecution. Uh, We find it slightly strange that many of the people who had refugee status both here and in Canada have been coming back to Sri Lanka, and indeed some of those who have got this special refugee stamp have indeed come to the Sri Lankan High Commission and asked for passports. And I think this is something that needs to be monitored. Um, what, what does that mean? Unwrap that for me. What, 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 are, you, what are you saying What I'm there? suggesting is that there are many reasons for coming to Australia, one of which is your wonderful lifestyle. And, you know, there are many people who come here for economic reasons, for the opportunities I have to offer, some for the education and so on. You know, the number of people who do come here legitimately is very, very high each year. Now, there are other people who may not be able, as you said, to afford it, not only the rich tigers, but, you know, other middle-class Sri Lankans come over. And, of course, there are many people who sell the possibility of being a refugee. You're well aware that it's been established that some of these refugee boats charge quite a lot of money, and uh, they take up the opportunity and arrive here. Now, if they're claiming refugee status from persecution, it is slightly surprising that they also want a Sri Lankan passport and come back to Sri Lanka. So the people that have been implied, that came to Australia in boats after the, the terrible conflict uh, in your country uh, have got refugee status here are now going to the Sri Lankan High Commission and asking for passports from, for their own country? Not all of them. Not all of them, because not all of them obviously would have the money to fly back, but a few of them have with this refugee uh, status, and I think this is something that both the High Commission and your immigration need to work together on, not indeed to deprive people from coming back to Sri Lanka if they wish to, because, of course, we're happy to, and if some of them bring some of the money that they brought with them back and would like to invest it in Sri Lanka, that would be very welcome. But I think we need to get it very clear, both the Australians and the Sri Lankans, ours for our good name, yours for your immigration policies, whatever they might be, that people should not come here under false pretenses. 
Now, the people who came across in boats, as I said, some of them had a lot of money to pay their way over. Some of them could have been poor. Some of them could have got away beforehand. And as you know, some of the people who started coming over were here in 2009 before the conclusion of the war. This is not an entirely new phenomenon. Some people got away to India and are in refugee camps there. The Indians have now begun to encourage some of them through the good officers of the UN to come back to Sri Lanka. So when people are coming back to Sri Lanka, now that the terrorist uh, conflict is over. Um, I think the rest coming out here may have other reasons than simply political uh, refuge. Having said that, of course, it's up to Australia to decide whom they want to keep and so on. And uh, good luck to our traps if they can live here and achieve something that many other Sri Lankans would give their eye teeth for. So if the people that came to Australia on the boats from uh, fleeing the conflict and particularly the terrible last closing stages of the conflict, if they sought to go back home, uh, as far as you're concerned as a member of the Sri Lankan parliament, there is no uh, threat against their person uh, in in any way uh, if they sought to go back home to their native Sri Lanka? None at all. And that is why, as you know, um, nearly uh, 300,000 people managed to escape from the LTT towards us and we have looked after them. We managed, as the UN has testified, to eliminate all the health risks that they had suffered earlier. We have now resettled most of them. Uh, all but 17,000 have gone back to their original places of, uh, where they came from. And we've managed to sort of restore things like schooling and health services and irrigation services. So there is, of course, much more to do with regard to proper housing, with employment prospects and so on. But things are moving, and we would welcome some of the uh, people who have now established themselves in fairly wealthy circumstances in Australia. I had plenty of them at meetings I had, both in Canberra and Sydney, Singhala, Tamil, Muslim, and all of that. If any of them are willing to give a little bit of uh, what they have here to support their poorer brethren in Sri Lanka, we would be delighted. Is there any requirement that they somehow, um, uh, what's the word, um, speak the language, uh, profess a religious philosophy of th- that's, uh, that's ordered or seen as the, 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 um, the position of the Sri Lankan government? In other words, a, a, a Buddhist position, Sinhalese language, things like this. Is there any requirement that they be forced to do that? complete nonsense. You're probably aware that in 1956, um, um, Sinhalese was made the only official language, which I think many people now realize was a mistake. In 1987, Tamil was also made an official language. From the 1940s on, when uh, we had, uh, it was actually the British was still in charge, uh, the Sinhalese and Tamil politicians in Colombo together decided that mother tongue education should be compulsory that all Sinhalese should be educated in the mother tongue and all Tamils in their mother tongue. And uh, equality with regard to the education system in terms of mother tongue education was always there. I myself fought for a long time, having been educated in Sinhala mother tongue myself, for English medium to be permitted as an option. And this, uh, um, the last government in 2001 uh, agreed on this. So now English is also available as an option. And I'm delighted to say that even many parents who are monolingual in either Sinhala or Tamil would like their children to be educated in English. With religion, we really have not had religious conflict at all. And indeed, the Hindu clergy have, on the whole, been remarkably peaceful. There were uh, a few members of the Christian clergy who tended to take up a Tamil nationalist claw, uh, position. Just there have been some members of the Christian clergy and well, the Buddhist clergy who adopted a nationalist singular position, but that is not the practice of any of the official religious religions and religious leaders in Sri Lanka and their movements towards ecumenism. Uh, you're probably aware that our Chief Justice and indeed our Attorney General, not the new Chief Justice appointed last week, a lady, but the previous Chief Justice was Catholic, so was the Attorney General. Um, we have had um, 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 army commanders who were Tamil or Christian. We have had the um, um, Air Force commander was an Anglican. Um, I don't think there's any question whatsoever that Sri Lanka imposes any beliefs, languages on its people. My guest is Professor Wajiva, uh, Rajiva Wijasinghe. He's a member of the Parliament of Sri Lanka. My name's Steve Austin, and this is ABC Local Radio Queensland. A few years ago, uh, uh, Professor Wajasinghe, we had uh, raised here in Australia a very real concern uh, by Rohan Gunaratna, one of the world's authorities on South Asian terrorism, that the uh, the Tigers, the Tamil Tigers, had been 
procuring a range of things, arms, explosives and technical devices from Australia to assist in their campaign against the uh, government of Sri Lanka. Do you know, know if four years down the track that's in any way uh, still active or still being considered? I mean, the short term says I don't because I'm not an expert on terrorist armaments. I do know the real problem was the enormous amount of money that the LTT collected uh, from the diaspora, uh, very often through th- threats and so on. They also managed to cream off a lot of money that uh, in from 2002 onwards, uh, the Sri Lankan government tried to arrange for rehabilitation of the North during the days of the so-called ceasefire uh, agreement. Uh, we know they took a lot of stuff that they used for military purposes from some of the NGOs. In fact, I was told today by an Australian parliamentarian how some of the boat people, the so-called boat people, have turned up in a vehicle, in a boat marked Caritas, and I certainly don't think Caritas gave it to them. But there was a lot of extortion. There was a lot of uh, um, weapons procurement, for instance, during the ceasefire agreement, uh, when we had a Norwegian monitoring mission, uh, the uh, Navy. Uh, said that there was a ship bringing arms. This was denied. The then Sri Lankan Minister of Defence, who had, in a sense, staked his reputation on the tigers being little lambs, said, no, no, don't search the boat. But the Norwegian monitors got on the boat, and then they discovered a whole stack of weapons. They were ordered off the boat, and the poor guys jumped into the water. I met some, uh, one of them afterwards. And the LTT just blew the boat sky high up. So there was massive procurement of weapons during, during the ceasefire period. And I'm afraid the lack of uh, determination on the part of uh, some of you guys, I mean, the Australian government, unlike any other Western government, did not ban the LTT. And I'm deeply sorry about this. We were told today that um, by one MP that this was due to um, some political partisan considerations. I don't really know. But it's pretty shameful that people, in order to get elected, should not have stopped terrorism. I think that's something that Australia must take very seriously and remedy. Your country, as far as I'm aware, is the only country in recent history, uh, perhaps even in modern history, that has successfully, at least militarily, defeated a registered terrorist organisation. Now that your country is heading on a path of what uh, could reasonably be called normality, what is your message to any uh, former Tamil or Tamils from Sri Lanka, any uh, people who've sought uh, refugee status in Australia, any of your citizens of Sri Lanka that, that, that are living in Australia that, that look back to Sri Lanka? What's your message to them? I think one important thing about the way we got rid of the Tamil terrorists was the fact that on our soil we treated the people amongst whom the terrorists functioned as our people. The vast majority of Tamils, I think, were against the terrorists. All Tamil political parties, bar one, supported us. Some former LTT elements were on our side, and therefore we ha- we were necessarily more humane. You know, I'm not going to point fingers at people like your soldiers or the Americans who, you know, when they're trying to get rid of the Taliban, treat all Afghans alike and perhaps kill civilians with less concern, although I don't think deliberately, uh, simply because these are others. But the Sri Lankan people are our people. We did our best by them. The LTT did put a lot of civilians in danger, and some of them succumbed, which was very sad. But we have to make sure that those who are left have a better future. And if those who got away and enjoying a much better future in countries like this uh, are concerned about their brethren in Sri Lanka, it would be good if they could help. I have been asking all the whole Sri Lankan community, or of all, you know, Sinhalese, Tamil, Muslims, the Burgers, uh, Buddhist, Christians, Hindus, Muslims, to please contribute. And while they should contribute to the people who are worse off than them, I think we all have to recognize that it was the Tamil people of the Vanni who were really most brutally treated by the LTT. So if they can help them with regard to uh, a better economic and social future, it would be l- wonderful if they got together here, appreciated each other's strengths, understood each other's grievances, but finally got together for the more vulnerable left.